Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. Uh, I've been anticipating this episode since we started the OG Pod in 2019. I'm very, very proud to bring on board. Uh, we, we, we specialize in OGs. We know OGs from all over the place. And this guy is the OG OG when it comes to writing about the uh, Philadelphia Black Mafia. Um, we're going to get into a little Tim Donahue. We're going to get into... Uh, a little bit of the Philadelphia Italian Mafia, but uh, Sean Patrick Griffin, the esteemed, the distinguished Sean Patrick Griffin, thank you for joining me. This is a, truly a, a pleasure and an honor. It's been a long time in, in coming. We thought this would happen at some point, Scott. Great yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, Sean wrote the book Black Brothers Incorporated, which, uh, in my opinion, or at least for, you know, from uh, my reading, it's my favorite non traditional organized crime book. When I say traditional, I mean Italian. Um, and it, and it, and it chronicles the Philadelphia black mafia, which was the precursor to what is, uh, now in Philadelphia, the JBM or the junior black mafia. Uh, it all started in the late sixties, early seventies with, uh, this, this kind of, uh, collision of crime and civil rights and religion um, it's fascinating. Uh, Sean, why don't you just you know, tell us about getting into the uh, subject in terms of a researcher and a writer, and then let everybody know that you were also a Philadelphia police officer at one point. Sure. Um, well, how the project happened is uh, its own fascinating story. When I was a graduate student, my mentor, Alan Block, he's since passed away. He's a legendary organized crime scholar. And he was doing research on heroin trafficking along the Eastern seaboard in the 1960s. He knew partly because of my policing experience, but I also had family in policing. He figured that I would have connections in the Philadelphia Police Department for these particular heroin traffickers. Uh, one was named Frank Moten, one was named Jack Brown. It has nothing to do with Philly's Black Mafia, but anyway. So sure enough, I go to, at the time, Philadelphia's organized crime unit. I meet a bunch of detectives who I didn't know, by the way, I just, they were kind enough to uh, humor me. And I told them what I was looking for. Now this is, this shows you how long ago this is. This is obviously in the late eighties, early nineties. And um, they didn't have, there was before computers. So they had the old, you know, Dewey decimal system, you know, the roll of deck, the, not roll of decks, but you know, the, the three by five cards, they didn't have any files on these guys, but they did have two, a three by five index card for each of these two heroin traffickers. And that wasn't much of a help or whatever. But the detective who was helping me said, well, why do you care about these two guys? And I told him what Alan was doing. And he said, oh, well, if you're looking for heroin trafficking, then you need to be researching Philadelphia's Black Mafia. Now, Scott, you and your audience have to understand, I was born and raised in the city. My father and my brother were both cops. And I was researching organized crime in grad school. So the odds that I would never have even heard of this group didn't make much sense. So he takes me into a room and there are boxes of files about this group called Philadelphia's Black Mafia. So being as clueless as I was back then, I didn't think anything of it. I went back to State College, reported to Allen and said, hey, look, nothing on uh, Frank, um, Jack Brown or Frank Moten. But you're not going to believe this. They have boxes and boxes of, uh, of Intel files on a group called Philadelphia's Black Mafia. And he said, well, you're going to write about that, right? And I said, no, because at the time I was doing Italians, just like everybody else. And he said, are you crazy? As an author, who wouldn't love a shot at a title that most people are not familiar with, with access to those sorts of files? Not to mention at the time, you know, if you're going back to the 90s, it was dated enough to not be sensitive. So some people in law enforcement would talk to you at least because as, as your readers and listeners may know, if something's really hot, if it was happening right now in March of 2024, it's hard getting people to speak yeah, even on off on you know. record. Yeah. I'm on the, yeah, I, it's hard. Yeah. So he said, it, you know, you'll, they'll be able to actually talk to you and it's, it's not, it's not too old where they're dead. So you, you can actually have the best of both worlds. An author would dream at this. So I actually engaged in this project reluctantly because I knew nothing about it. It wasn't sexy or whatever. And then my goodness, as your intro said, once I got involved in it, I, I just couldn't grasp. And by the way, I give these lectures to my students every semester and people still have a hard time grasping that volatile mix, as you said, of religion, politics, and crime. 
And that's why it's, it's one of those stories where when I wrote that book, that, that book on my hard drive, if, if it was just, just in regular times, New Roman font was 1400 pages. And that was why, because there was so much going on and I felt obligated, you know, when I was writing it in the nineties to explain to people who couldn't possibly imagine, well, what do you mean the nation of Islam believed in this and did this? What do you mean the civil rights movement changed from that? You had to do that in addition to the actual just straight true crime story to explain how these people, first of all, got involved and why they were allowed to go on for so long without any interference from law enforcement. Well, and I also, I always find the, the juxtaposition in the public interest factor of here where, and I'm interested to get your take on it, like reporting on Italian mafia, whether you're talking about modern day, definitely more when you're talking about history, there's a romanticism factor yeah. of it that makes people feel kind of warm and fuzzy in a weird way and then you you transition to this kind of organized crime which at the end of the day is the exact same thing as the other kind of organized crime but it's not as palatable there's nothing kind of warm and fuzzy about it it's it's just like brute force yes. raw criminality um just ruthless di diabolical violent so it's 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 um it's a different beast, but it's the same beast at the same time, I guess. Well, the problem is there there are many things with this topic. Uh, I oftentimes in my class, uh, I'll I'll dissect the uh, Godfather film because people routinely say it romantic romanticizes organized crime. I think people get caught up in how it's a great film and it's got legendary stars and. Of course, the dress back then confuses people. Well, that's how everyone dressed. It wasn't just a dress as a gangster where you're wearing, wearing jacket and tie or a jacket all the time, whatever. And the music was great and all that. But if you actually look at the story, you have constant people informing on other groups. It happens multiple times throughout the thing. If you really just look at the bare bones crime, it's brutal. It tore the Corleone, Corleone family apart. I mean, yeah. one yet, brother it, kills another brother. The yes. other brother gets killed in a violent mob assassination. Mm -hmm. the, yes. the daughter is married to a horrible guy who they end up killing. Yes. Uh, so, but, but yet people really do look at that fondly, even though if you strip everything away, you go, wow, that's a dastardly business. Um, and by the way, when I was writing Black Brothers in the 90s, that was really in the back of my mind because that also at the time was happening uh, when it came to all sorts of groups, I was in the belly of the beast. You know, I literally had access to almost anything you could want as a researcher. It wasn't just Philly PD. It was the IRS. It was ATF. It was DEA. You know, anyone who ever, for those who don't know, there are two, actually two editions of the book. The first book came out in 2005. That book had 104 pages of endnotes in eight point single space font. And if you look at those endnotes, you say, oh, my goodness. It, it had every federal agency, all the departments within Philly, all the different units that collected data, um, including many cases that never went to trial, even though they pretty much knew who did what. Um, I did that on purpose because I couldn't get over the fact that people were glamorizing these hustlers who were terrorizing entire sections of the city for decades, who murdered dozens of people, um, you know, beheaded one person, as you know. This, the stories were just so outrageous and the idea that people were glamorizing these guys. And some of them, as you know, Scott, because you read the book, some of them actually wound up going into politics. Yeah. And I would even say that. Italian the, certainly the, that the, ever would have happened. But the thing is, no, <laughs> nobody knows a thing about them. But I also would say that some of the glamorization of that group, I think, has grown. I think that almost the J Junior Black Mafia almost has a more of a a sexiness um to uh yeah. brag about or to talk about affiliation i know a lot of the you know the the modern day philadelphia mob guys the joey merlino crew they love those guys and, they, and vice versa the, the the jbm loves the merlino crew and the merlino crew loves the jbm and that's not so far removed from the 70s when uh the the philly black mafia was working with the the Italians, Angelo Bruno, Long John Martorano, and those guys, but it wasn't 
as chummy. I would say. Well, there, there's also there's also a generational factor here, which is that by the time you get to the '90s, these idiots, these mom stars, are bragging about what they're doing. They want the fame. Yeah, the opposite and, of Angelo Bruno. Yeah, and it's the opposite of Philly's Black Mafia. Those guys, you know, you, you never right. saw Sam. Yes, good, you never great. you never saw Sam Christian or Ron Harvey or any of the heavy hitters doing the nonsense that you would see JBM guys doing yeah. with their big, you know, brash gold knuckle chain yeah. knuckles and the chains. Bucky, and Bucky, Bucky, see. yeah, Bucky, right? You know, yeah. so, uh, so it, it was a generational thing. Um, but that, but you correctly point out back in the day, they got along well. You never saw any fighting between uh, the Bruno family and the and Philly's Black Mafia. And they, they were hanging out in bars together routinely. They would help each other with drug deals. In most cities, there's usually very little internecine fighting. Yeah. Well, I know just uh, again, uh, on an aside, I know that just kind of talking about people that we know today, you know, Will Smith, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, was very close to Bucky Davis, who was the boss of JBM for a period of time before he was assassinated. I think uh, Bucky helped him, um, allegedly helped him uh, with a dispute over royalties, over a song or a sample. Um, So this was, you know, you. Will Smith, it doesn't get any bigger than Will Smith, and he's running around with JBM before I guess he became the the triple threat that he that he became. But at that time, he was still a a, a very prominent figure in pop culture, you know, uh, in the music industry. So yeah, the 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 the, uh, the nexus points are varied in 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 Philadelphia black uh, mob culture yeah. going forward. You know, from the oh, late yeah. '60s all the way till today. Yeah, well, the the '60s were crazy. I don't know how much you want to get get into this, Scott. But no, let's I mean, talk, let's, talking about it uh, all. I mean, it, okay. Well, for for the audience who may not know, the reason I said earlier that you had this crazy nexus between organized crime, religion, and politics is because the civil rights movement starts out in the '50s very peaceful, and by the time you get to the mid '60s, there are segments in the black community who are not satisfied with the pace of changes. And so it becomes more militant. So you see the Black Panthers on the scene and the Nation of Islam. Well, in Philly, the Nation of Islam was headed by a person named Jeremiah Shabazz. His birth name was Jeremiah Pugh. Um, Of the 56 mosques around the country, every city had its own mosque. We were Philadelphia was number 12. Um, Philly was one of the most prominent, probably after Chicago and Detroit. I don't know about New York, but either way, that was there were definitely up there, be, partly because Jeremiah Shabazz was so close to Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the movement at the time. And of course, well, it the, all started in Detroit. It all yeah. the movement started in Detroit, yeah. and, and Elijah Muhammad took power by, you know, for what we think, assassinating uh, Farhad, who had been the guy that uh, founded it. Right. He disappeared. Nobody ever found him. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, the only reason they figure so prominently in the Philly Black Mafia story is because most of the leaders in Philly's Black Mafia were also leaders in the temple. The Nation of Islam back then had a thing called the Fruit of Islam, which was the paramilitary force that protected the mosque, protected the minister, um, and they were all the heavies. And in Philly, they were almost all Black Mafia guys. And when I say Black Mafia guys, when Philly's Black Mafia forms in the 1960s, if you look at the leadership, they're all in their late 20s, early 30s, which is important for people who do what you and I do for a living, Scott, explaining, well, how, why would that age group be good? It's ideal for somebody who's, whose business is based on extortion. You can only go up to so many drug dealers or pimps or bar owners that are allowing gambling and things to go on in their establishments. You can only go up to them so often and asking for money unless you have some street reputation. Well, these guys were in the sweet spot. They were old enough to have record, record, criminal records and reputations on the street, but they were young enough to enforce it. They were literally in their prime when it came to being a street enforcer. So when they form, uh, and they're all these, not young, but youngish mobsters, they're, they're able to impose their will on the street. And because they were tied in with the mosque, the Nation of Islam back then was known for being very, very... Uh, how would you say, street savvy. They recruited from prisons. Well, that confused everybody. It confused residents and it confused law enforcement because when you have a Nation of Islam leader come out and talk to the press and say, well, yes, we've got criminals in our mosque. My goodness, we're actually recruiting from prisons to reform them. So there was no way to weed out, okay, well, what part of that is true versus what part is street hustlers who are using the front of the mosque 
extorting the heck out of people, terrorizing people, and funneling money back into the mosque. There was no way to separate that. This is also at a time period where the FBI is running their COINTEL program, where they're literally fomenting discord on purpose. I always use the one easy example where they're writing letters to the editor of major newspapers as as Elijah Muhammad, but it's actually not, it's him, it's them, but they're writing letters disparaging Martin Luther King because they're trying to get the different um, black uh, civil rights movements pitted against each other to foment discord. That, that was Hoover's idea. Well, if you're simply a regular person living in black Philly at the time, you've got these lunatics who are extorting people, killing people. You hear those stories. You're not quite sure what to believe. You know that they run the mosque and Jeremiah Shabazz is in the news all the time in part because of the nation, but also because he was one of the main people who recruited Muhammad Ali into the temple. Um, and so he was, you know, he was a national figure at that time. And you're seeing these hustlers, not only with the nation of Islam, they then start getting government funding because this is the, again, you talk about sweet spot as a gangster. At the time, the Justice Department had this radical idea that poverty caused crime. And what better way to stop crime if you just started giving money to people who are causing crime and committing crimes. Yeah. And so they started doing these things that were called community action agencies. CAAs. This is, this is so, when just for, yeah, not to spoon feed it to the audience though. I apologize for people that are offended that I have to, but I just want to make sure I, I always assume that people are coming to us for the first time, even though I know we have a, a, a devoted um, consumption base, but this is where you see this, this nexus point of civil rights movement, religion, and crime all coming together and then helping veil or provide cover for the criminality by veiling it in uh, community outreach, civil rights movement, uh, protection behind religion. Yeah. And, and then, and and then, so you bring, I, then you bring in people like Muhammad Ali and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and you have, you know... Uh, all-time great athletes and pop culture phenomenons that are co-signing. Yeah. Well, that, that's the thing. When Muhammad Ali would visit Philly, uh, and by the way, these are some of his, that they're, you know, the, his so-called years in exile were spent in Philly. He left, he left Chicago and came I, to Philly. I, I believe it was Chicago, okay. but, but he, yeah, he comes to Philly when, when he's, uh, you know, not sanctioned to fight because he uh, refused the draft. He comes to Philly because there's a person named Major Coxon. Scott knows who he is, but for your audience, Scott, Major Coxon was not necessarily a member of Philadelphia's Black Mafia, but he was sort of the hub of the whole thing. He wasn't somebody who was going to extort somebody, but he knew all of them. He's sort of like the Henry Hill of this story, actually. He just knows everybody. And, and he was so with somebody him. that was, did he come from a criminal background? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But here's the thing. He had, he had a legendary criminal background, but it was all flim flams. It was all right, like he was a con man. Stolen license plates, financial hustles. He did serve time in federal prison um, for just for financial frauds. But um, he actually ran for mayor of Camden, New Jersey right. in 1972. That's a great story, by the way, because of course Muhammad Ali was the one campaigning with him. Yeah, we did. And, we did. Uh, a, we did a whole episode um, on the on the Major Coxon murder, and we got oh, into that. I but I, I, we wanted to have you on that episode for whatever reason we couldn't. But yes, let's kind of augment that a little bit with uh major coxon was um a very prominent but all, was just uh was like ubiquitous yes. in certain oh, listen, parts of new jersey and philadelphia his, in the late it, 60s it, early 70s the, the local magazines routinely had him on the cover here was a career criminal who was being lauded in the press all the time he and also owned a bunch hmm? He also owned a, a handful of nightclubs and bars. And this is where you see the confluence of Bruno family members, Philly Black Mafia guys, Philadelphia athletes, you know, professional athletes, politicians. It was this amazing mix of people who all knew Major Cox. And he had a whole chain of apartments where he would have uh, all the local drug dealers could stash their stuff, cut their deals and all that sort of stuff. He was just involved in everything. But when he ran for mayor of Camden in, in, in 1972, there's that great fight with uh, Jerry Quarry and Muhammad Ali. In yeah, I was June about to say that. Yep. The first, the first thing Muhammad Ali says after he wins, when he gets the microphone, he says, I dedicate this victory to the next mayor of Camden, New Jersey, Major Coxon. And so 
with Major in Philly, he was also active in the civil rights movement. He wasn't an NAACP leader or anything like that. But again, he would hang out with the, that, at the time, the head of the NAACP, Cecil Moore. So if you're a resident of Black Philly and you're just watching Major Coxon hang out with all the people who you're told are Black Mafia guys, and the Black Mafia guys, you know for a fact, are heavy hitters in the Nation of Islam, but you also, and, and not, to, not to mention, they're now also getting government funds in these community action agencies. And Philly's Black Mafia opened up at least three of them, probably four, but at least three. And so they're getting press conferences with city council members and judges at the press conferences. You can reasonably say, I don't know what to make of this, because it's crazy to think that these are murderers who are literally terrorizing entire sections of the city, federally funded gangsters who get to hide behind the veil of religion and civil rights. I mean, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing, amazing part of organized crime history that very few people know. And the thing was, back then, if you look, I mentioned at the beginning of this that when I started researching in the 90s that I looked at the Philadelphia Organized Crime Unit files. People may not know that organized crime units back then were not called organized crime units. In Italian, pardon me, in New York, it was called the Italian Squad. In Philly, it was called Intersect, which was short for Internal Security Against the Emerging Italian Threat. Everything at the federal and local level was Italians, Italians, Italians. So beyond all the craziness that I just briefly mentioned about civil rights and religion and all this or whatever, and the federal funding, law enforcement's not looking for them. It's not what they're trained to do. They, they don't know about this. How would they know about this? Um, and the FBI, of course, had its own problems with COINTELPRO. So even if somebody wanted to contact the FBI, if they were being victimized, they didn't trust them. Well, you know, we, we joked about the Godfather earlier uh, in this uh, podcast. Well, you remember from Godfather Part Two, there's that great scene where the young Vito Corleone says to his uh, to his buddy, hey, why why is he extorting a fellow Italian? And he says, because he knows that there's he can't go to anybody. Right. No one. He can't. <laughs> that's that's how extortion works. It doesn't. Oh, you pray. You pray on your own. I, yes, I, you know, of course. Going back to the the remote, the romanticism factor. I do talks in Detroit quite a bit on the Purple Gang and the Jewish community, the Jewish community in Detroit just thinks these were the greatest guys in the world that these 100 <laughs> Jewish homicidal maniacs that that ran the city of Detroit underworld from 1925 to 1935 a lot of people think they're, st they're still around people ask me all the time well what's going on with the purple gang i'm like they've been gone for 100 years but besides that when i do my talks i try to explain to all these nice elderly jewish men and women that want me to come and tell them about the the purple gang being al capone or sorry being robin hood uh protecting them against al capone and i tell them no no al capone and the purples work together and the purples out of the let's say a thousand people that they killed in that 10 years 95 percent of those people that they killed were jewish and 95 percent, if not 100 percent, of the people that they extorted were jewish yeah well that's yeah I, I, i'm i'm surprised to hear that well uh, I could say so much about that. I'll make it. I'll make a comment about the Black Mafia in that regard, though. When when Black Brothers Inc. came out in 2005, the original cover had the backdrop was a homicide photo of one of the Black Mafia guys who had been left uh, lying dead uh, at the Philadelphia Naval Yard, and on top of that were the mugshots of all the founding Black yes. Mafia members. Well, I gave a book signing one time, and a Black minister came up to me after this after the talk. And he said, you've done the black community a great service because I've been preaching for years that if you wind up in this life, if you all want to be gangsters, this is what happens. You either wind up dead or you wind up in prison. And I thought, wow, OK, well, that's pretty good. I felt, you know, I, that's not why I wrote the book, but OK, that's nice. Months later, he calls me and uh, I'll never forget it. And he's all dejected. And he said, well, I was wrong about that. And here what had happened in I, I never saw this personally, but I, I, my students told me about this too. Apparently, people on the black market took the cover and put it on black t-shirts. T-shirts, and they were selling it all at SEPTA, Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation yep. Authority, and they were they were selling out. I bet. Yes, couldn't yeah, keep them, had, couldn't keep them in stock. Yeah, and so instead of sending the message, "Hey, don't get involved in that lifestyle," 
the the street took it as man they said they were bad mf mfers and sure enough they were they were, even wrote a book about them yep it you know totally defeated the the point of his uh, his argument and let's you know let's kind of give a emphatic end to this one part of the story about major coxon and how it all played out for him isn't it, it kind of exemplifies all this he loses the mayoral election in the spring of 72 he doesn't last a year Am I right? Or yep. less than a year, he gets into a a real uh, quagmire where there was a missing dope. Uh, the Gambino crime family in New York City is missing some dope. They reach out to him. Can you help us find it? If you find it, we'll we'll give you three hundred thousand uh, dollars. He promises that money to his friends in the. Philadelphia Black Mafia Mafia to help them retain or re uh, get the drugs back from the people that stole them, and then uh, retribution on on the thieves. That all gets messed up, and then all of a sudden it goes from the Gambinos reaching out to Major Coxon for him to help them to the Philadelphia Mafia looking at Major Coxon and saying. You brought us into this whole thing. You made us all these promises. Now you're on the hook for it. And they killed him. Of course. Well, the, <laughs> that, that happened earlier, too, in the Fat Ty Palmer story, because they're very similar. Fat Ty Palmer was killed uh, in April. In of Atlantic 72. City. Right? Yeah, at the Club Harlem for the same reason. I mean, it's what, the reason I'm comparing the two is because Fat Ty Palmer was very close friends with Philly's Black Mafia, as Mr. was Major Mr. Coxon. Right? And, and it didn't, yes. But, but it, it didn't matter to them. It was business. And so in Major Coxon's case, when the the actual people who stole the drug shipment from the Gambinos, they instead of people just getting the money or getting the drugs, they kill them. Well, the Gambinos go crazy and they say, well, first of all, we're not going to get the money now. We're not going to get the drugs. And now the feds are all over the murders. You know, right. we're not paying you anything for this. This is these are not the services we required. And then and, Sam, uh, and, and so, Sam, Ron and Sam are like, well, guess yeah. what? You promised us this. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. did so, this. Right. Now give it to us. And if you don't, you're going to pay the repercussions. Yeah. And that's why, you know, if people read Black Brothers, the reason that I detail the surveillance reports of Major Coxon in the days leading up to his murder, I wanted to demonstrate that he clearly had no sense that he was in jeopardy. He was just living his normal life. He had no idea that he was about to be killed. And um, that, that's just how they were. And they, they came would, into and, his house. They came into his house. Yeah, that was he was he, he was neighbors with Muhammad Ali. Right. Uh, like Muhammad Ali they, they, moved to Cherry Hill, New Jersey, to live on the same street as Major Coxon. I'm I'm now starting to remember it. Uh, Muhammad Ali was born in Louisville, trained in Chicago and Florida, and then when he was exiled, he gravitated to Philadelphia, New Jersey area because of the Nation of Islam, because of Major Coxon. Um, and then clearly there were a lot of people that were going to Muhammad Ali after the fact. Um, and at that point, Muhammad Ali kind of, uh, didn't remember major Coxon's name. So he, he, first of all, he, he not only dedicated the victory in, in June of 72 to major Coxon, he was his financial advisor and was always in public, literally campaign with him. You can see TV ads yeah. and, and, and footage, but then when major Coxon get killed, gets killed, Killed and law enforcement goes to Muhammad Ali and says, hey, we want to give you protection because we have reason to think that you might be next because your affiliation with Coxon. He said, oh, no, no, no. I, I wasn't a friend with Coxon. He's he's not a Muslim, so I, I could never be friends with him. And they just yeah. wanted to get away from that. And then I just I don't want to get too deep into this, but just to give people that might not understand the, the stakes that we were talking about, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar who in the world of basketball was just as big of a deal as Muhammad Ali was in boxing at that time. And just like Muhammad Ali had um, converted in a very uh, controversial way at the right when he was becoming a, a professional and he was tied to a, like a, a rival sect of the black Muslim family that opposed uh, Elijah Muhammad and said that Elijah Muhammad was like a false prophet. He right. gave them <laughs> among other things, <laughs> right? He gave these, the, they were called the Hanafi Muslims. Yes. He gave them a mansion to live in, in Washington, DC. This was owned by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar 
and allegedly the Philadelphia Black Mafia representing the Nation of Islam came to D.C. and they massacred, um, what, eight people, including little kids. Yeah. Uh, I, just, I believe it was all happened I, I believe in a couple of years. It, yeah, yeah. I believe, I believe, it, well, this, the, the Hanafi killings were January of 73. They were actually before Coxon. And, oh, yeah. So it's all um, in the yeah. same, yeah. Okay. It's all in the oh, same yeah, yeah. couple of years or two. Yeah. 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 January of 73, they travel. Eight black mafia guys go down. Uh, I believe they killed seven. Four of them were under two years of age. They're all babies. Oh, it's brutal. It's brutal. And that's why if people see the uh, American Gangster show uh, that broadcasts on TV every once in a while, they'll, they'll hear what I'll say, tell you again in case people haven't seen it. Um, one of the homicide detectives went into the basement uh, to wash his hands from the crime scene, and there was a, a sink. He went to wash his hands. He saw what he thought was a doll, and in fact, it was the nine-day-old baby they had killed. It's so sad. Um, it's so yeah. tragic. They, um, and, they, and, and by the way, there's a great follow-up to that story, which is that obviously, well, I have two things to say about that. I hope people who are not familiar with Philadelphia's Black Mafia are hearing this half hour we're already in or whatever, and they're going, wait, Muhammad Ali, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, <laughs> Nation of Islam, politics, civil rights, slaughtering families. Malcolm X, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it, it's ridiculous that people don't know anything about this, whereas they can say, John Gotti, John Gotti, you know, Al Capone, they can say these relatively trivial people in the grand scheme of things. Uh, and yet, there, man, there's you got, been a you, you wrote a book about this and it's the Bible, but you're talking, you take a subject like Gotti or Bulger or Capone, and it's like the either I don't know if it's the public's interest or the publishing industry's interest, but I just can't get over how they'll green light yes. the 50th book written about Whitey Bulger. This is coming from his third cousin. That one came from his second cousin. And so they're all telling the same story. Oh, I, I can't. But yeah. this story has only been written one time, and that's a good thing. But it's just to your point, everybody knows about those other stories ad nauseum, but some of the great stories can really slip through the cracks. And we're hoping that we're, you know, prevent <laughs> well, you yeah, a gem. Them. Well, anyway, so the follow up, the follow up to the, the Hanafi killings, though, is that uh, one of the people, one of the black mafia guys who was there named James Bubbles Price, uh, he didn't like the idea they were killing the kids. Uh, his argument was, look, I don't mind killing the grown ups for what they said about Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. Fine. But the kids didn't do anything. And they can't. His argument was they can't be witnesses. So why are we killing the babies? And, you know, John Clark famously said, actually, it was Ron Harvey who famously said, uh, they have the seed of the hypocrite in them, the, meaning they're the wrong Muslim sect. Right. So we have to kill them. Well, anyway, he becomes an informant against these guys. That's partly how the case develops against the black mafia guys. He winds up being killed in prison. They killed uh, Bubbles. They killed Bubbles Price in prison. Yeah, well, <laughs> he I don't I'd love to know the story on this, but we'll never know, obviously. He um he he took a chance. He decided not to testify. The problem was that his his uh, conversations were recorded, so they didn't need him. They were just going to play the recordings. Well, he didn't bank on that. And when the warden wanted to put him in solitary confinement for his protection, he wanted to be housed with the black mafia guys. His argument was, no, no, I'll be able to schmooze them and convince them that this is all government lies. Well, you know, that 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 didn't work out so well. And uh, the, I, but ironically, the person who is serving time in prison for murdering Bubbles Price, think through the logic of this, is John Griffin. John Griffin was originally convicted on the Hanafi killings, but the course of appeals gets such that Amina Khalees is one of the, she, she survives, but she gets tired of the appeals. She, she can't just go through this trauma over and over again. One of the appeals, some of the black mafia guys get cut loose, including John Griffin. Well, had he not murdered James Bubbles Price for being the informant, he would have been free. Free, he wouldn't have been in there. <laughs> so yeah, he's free. he's he's literally in prison for murdering somebody who testified against him in a murder for which he's been acquitted. Right. Yeah, you you can't uh, you couldn't write that irony if you were uh, yeah. uh you know the best Hollywood screenwriter and and yeah. cast with it. Yeah. Um. So let's kind of get into the eighties for a second. Oh, can I? And, can, can, yeah, Scott, can I make one quick comment about sure, the community for, action? Agencies? Yes. Yes. Please. Because because the, the public is seeing this happen today. You know, there's that great there's that great quote we learn from history, we do not learn from history. 
you're doing well you're- when i got involved in this research i i had also done white collar crime research and so my whole thought was well if scott bernstein is a legendary career criminal who's got a rap sheet a mile long and there's this government money out there he's not going to put his name on it he'll put sean patrick griffin's name on it. he's not well when i got access to the documents it was literally the real names the real name. of all the criminals. I couldn't believe it because my mind couldn't grasp. Wait, they're actually, that's the plan. You're not hiding your background. That's why you're arguing that you need to community organize to right. get you and everybody else off the street into more legitimate pursuits. Well, what wound up happening, of course, is these hustlers took that money and manipulated it ways. Laundering money is an easy one because now you have a place where you can actually you're gonna have a bank account. You have people you're going to employ. So you and I would employ each other and all our buddies and our crew. So when, when, and now you're going to go get credit cards because when they call to verify your, your employment information, you and I get on the phone and say, oh yeah, Fred works for us. Yeah. John works for us. Yeah. That's his salary. And so they all start getting credit cards and they start renting things like cars and stealing them because none of this is real. This is they're a whole secondary. They're playing with house money. It's all house money. Yes. And, and on top of that, all those photo ops that I mentioned earlier, where they're, you know, be with the mayor, the head of the NAACP, with prominent business leaders, all these hustlers on TV and in the they press. Can le- they can leverage Yes, that. you know right. where I was going with that. That's exactly what they do. They go up to the street corner or to the bar owner and say, hey, you saw me yesterday in the press, right? I'm piped in. You know, you better pay. If you weren't about worrying about what we would do to you otherwise, whether it's firebombing your place or killing you and your family, at a minimum, you now realize we're piped in, so pay up. And so it terrified people. It confused people. And for somebody in organized crime, this was, I mean, heaven, heaven. So I'm interested to get your um, insight into how the organization evolves and then kind of turns into another organization. So a lot of the, and this is, this um, paradigm is actually probably pretty typical. I, I, I know uh, dozens of examples. You had a situation here where you had the guys that were in their 20s and 30s in the 70s that were mentoring teenagers, uh, having uh, teenage kind of errand boys, gophers. Um, and then when most of the Philadelphia Black Mafia is locked up, um, by the mid 80s, you had uh, these teenagers from the 70s were now in their mid 20s to late 20s. They had come up uh, mainly, I, I'm told it was a uh, nudie Mims, Robert Mims, who was uh, one of the original uh, founding fathers of uh, Philadelphia Black Mafia. He had a bunch of these young teenagers that were underneath him. And by the 80s, they wanted to open up shop. On their own group, they call it the Junior Black Mafia, but it it was a different. The, the vision was different. The application was different, even though they shared some similarities. Would you say they were more of just a straight drug organization? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The 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 abbreviated version of the uh, to answer your long question about the how this Sorry. developed over time. No, no. I'm, I'm saying I'm trying to defend my long argument. Yeah. yeah. My my long my long answer. Um, There are two major prosecutions of Philly's Black Mafia. The first one takes place in 1974. It's a DEA RICO case. That matters for my answer to you because for your audience who doesn't know, the feds don't start getting all these tools that you and I know now are common. They get wiretapping, for instance, in 68. We're just used to that. Well, that was new at the time. Uh, RICO is 1970. Yep. Things like this, all that that late 60s, early 70s, the feds are not only getting these tools, but they're slowly starting figure out, starting to figure out how to use them. So by the time you get to the 80s, and in Philly's Black Mafia's case, the next major prosecution happens in 84. 80, it's actually 84, 85. It's a long prosecution. Um, I argue that that effectively ends Philly's Black Mafia as a functioning syndicate. You'll still have people around and doing things, but they're not terrorizing entire neighborhoods, entire sections of the city or whatever. My argument, however, is that if you look around the country, including Boston, I'm not, I don't know about Detroit, I'll defer to you on that, but New York, Philly, Bo- organized crime for everybody at that time is taking a major hit because the feds finally have all these yeah. tools and they know how to use them. Yeah. I mean, it was but, the, 
the by the eighties, it was over with. The golden yes. era was over with. The Fed well, the had, is, had figured out how to weaponize Rico, and, yes. and everybody was living on borrowed time. Well, and the other thing too is, look, if you're good at what you do, and Philadelphia's Black Mafia was great at extortion because they killed people in public on person on, on purpose because they knew no one would testify against them. That was the idea. Well, you can do that only so often. But when you, you know, when and they, they made the colossal mistake, like many people do, where instead of just shaking down drug dealers, they go, hey, why not just take over the territory? Well, because if you've got the drugs on you or you're on a drug wiretap, it doesn't matter what a badass you are on the street. You can't, you know, you're, you don't, you don't have to need, they don't need people to testify against you. You're on the wires. Yeah. My, my uh, mentor, uh, George Anastasia, um, I, yeah, I, I tip my hat to him. One of the greatest quotes ever. You can't cross-examine a wiretap. Yeah. It, it is what it is. There's either. no way you can. Yeah. You can't, you can't, impe you yeah. can't impeach a, a wiretap. Yeah. And that, that, by the way, that's why you, we talked earlier about romanticizing. I don't like when people romanticize old school organized crime and they say, oh, well, they, they kept their mouth shut. By, they lived by but, a code back then. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, we'll never know if they were presented by an FBI agent or somebody else and said, hey, by the way, here's you yesterday. You want to rethink that answer? Right. And, and then you play them the tape. You know, what I mean, this all changed when people didn't have any option, but there was literally surveillance cameras. There's audio tape of all the things that were being done. So all their, you know, bluff about being tough guys and having a code, that was nonsense. The moment that you actually presented them with real problems, they all, they all started flipping on each other and it was over. Why do you think that the younger guys, the JBM didn't want to be as diversified as their predecessors? They just kind of wanted to be a, frankly, they just wanted to be a crack gang. That, um, that, that's well. That's that's they didn't part care of about extortion or gambling or civil rights or religion or trying to get government money. They were just they, they wanted to run the street corners. Yeah. Well, I think I think they're more representative of typical organized crime groups than the original black mafia guys. It, it's a shame in a way. As an historian, I understand why people focus on the high profile murders of the Hanafis, Major Cox, and I, I get that. I'm not naive, but. Um, part of the reason I spend so much time in Black Brothers on the financial frauds and the scams is because these were serious criminals. They they were not in it for five seconds and they were not impulsive and all that. These were like even the Hanafi killings we talked about earlier. They actually took the time to do a surveillance run down to the, the house first to assess how they could get away, what highways were close. They, they were so sophisticated in most of the things they did. It was remarkable. They were they were not a typical flashy organized crime group, like all the community action agencies. They had bylaws. They had grant, they had grant writers on staff. I mean, this is monumentally complicated what they were doing. Yeah, and by the time you get to the JBM in 85, I always argue that Philly's Black Mafia ends 84, 85. The JBM starts in 85 and goes until about 92. And they were really a flash in the pan. I, I have all those. So you don't, when I say that I, the JBM, I tell people that JBM still exists today. You're saying that that is not true. There are remnants of well, it, I mean, but not well, an organization. You, yes. Right. Yes. There are remnants of them. But but by the way, there are, believe it or not, there are still remnants of Philly's Black Mafia. No, uh, I know. I know. Even though they're way up in years. Like there were. Uh, no, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many years ago this was. It was sometime in the 2010s, though, where. Um, Ricardo McKendrick, who was a founding Black Mafia guy, he's in the famous Black Mafia ball picture of December 31st, 1973. He was arrested for the largest cocaine seizure in Philadelphia history, you know, within the last decade. So, uh, and I think it was um, Robert Bop Daddy Fairbanks. It was either he or Roosevelt Bob, Fitzgerald. Yeah. Uh, one of those two was arrested for shooting somebody when they were in their 70s. So, you know, Pretty they're, sure they're not coming out of prison for these racketeering charges and going into banking. I mean, they're just they're on the street, but they're no longer coalescing as a major crime syndicate. Well, and if you just go, I mean, again, uh, neither here nor there. But if you just go, uh, I, I've I've declared the Philadelphia Italian Mafia modern era, the Joey Merlino crew. I've declared them the Instagram Mafia. Um, they're obsessed with social media. You can. You can pretty much. Track these guys on a minute by minute basis from wherever you are um it's very unique in the world of organized crime that you have a group of guys that uh, should be thinking more about retirement and um social security checks since yeah. they're all getting in their 60s but they're all 
a very um I, I've also said that they're, they're only the only crime family that cares about cool is the is the Merlino group in in Philadelphia that no other mafia boss cares about being cool or what people think they're cool yeah. but it, it means a lot to the Merlino crew and, and I know I'm rambling but the reason I'm bringing this up is that if you go onto their social media accounts you go to their Instagrams a lot of them even this you know just in the recent months back in the summer a lot of them post photos with JBM guys that were JBM Benny Goff Tracy Mason are the two that are popping up in my head right now that are big Merlino guys, but so it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to see that. Well, it, it's funny that that, that crowd has always been stupid when it comes to this stuff though, because you'll remember, I wrote about this in black brothers incorporated when the Merlino guys would go to prison or pardon me, go to trial in the nineties, yeah, right. the JBM guys would show up. Would all at, show up at, there. Yes. Thinking support, that, thinking, right, thinking it was, yeah. And Joey's thinking this is, this is some type of like status symbol or see how many people love me. It's like, no, the, you, if, you should have told them stay as far away from me as possible. Yes. Yeah. And of course, detectives are literally there saying, okay, that's who's here. That's yeah. there. And they're they're looking at license plate. Thing. Who's <laughs> sitting with who in the gallery. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, this is, this is awesome. Um, Sean, I really enjoyed talking uh, J uh, JBM and Philadelphia black mafia and black and, and black brothers, Inc. Um, tell everybody where they can get all of the uh, all of the material, anything you want to do, kind of uh, and and learn more about this. Obviously, we have our episode that we did about a year, year, year and a half ago on the on the major. I think we did it on the anniversary of the major Cox and things. So it was probably about a year ago. Um, but Sean, let let everyone know where they can consume you. Sure, thanks. My website, which is seanpatrickgriffin.net, it's also .com, but either one doesn't matter. Um, You'll notice on, on my website, I actually have a subsection for organized crime. I don't update it as much as I used to, but uh, you'll see some updates on there. Importantly, though, uh, now that the 2005 version of Black Brothers is no longer available, I have posted the EndNote section on the website. So for anyone who wants to do follow-up research, I, I wanted to make sure people had access to that, all 104 pages of it. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter at SPG Author, SPG Author. Uh, I don't post a lot, but it's always, I just typically do newsworthy organized crime and white collar crime things. Well, thank you so much, Sean. Uh, this has been one of my all time favorite interviews. Um, I want to have you back on to talk about uh, your, your book, Game in the Game, and Tim Donahue. Uh, we'll do that soon. Thank you so much, Sean. Been great. Thanks, Scott. All right. For Scott Bernstein, I am Scott Bernstein. For Benny Behind the Glass, for Sean Patrick Griffin, I'm Scott Bernstein, OG Pod.